Hello, my name is Cameron, and today we are going to be assessing a patient and focusing on the shoulder complex to address their unilateral shoulder elevation. So what is shoulder elevation and how does it occur? The shoulder is a superficial ball and socket joint that allows for the greatest range of motion, being a joint that participates in flexion, extension, internal and external rotation, and ab and adduction, it is often the joint that is most susceptible to injury. Shoulder elevation can be caused by anatomical deformities, such as a kyphotic curvature of the spine, an injury, like a torn rotator tuff, cuff, or simply imbalanced muscles for continuous repetitive motion, like wearing a backpack strapped only to one shoulder. Individuals presenting with a shoulder elevation generally have muscle weakness in their pectorals and consequently muscle tightness in their upper trapezius. Our assessments will be performed on Nathan, who is an 18-year-old male with a sedentary lifestyle. He is a full-time high school student who enjoys watching Netflix, surfing the web, and walking his dog in his spare time. One thing to note, Nathan does have high-functioning Asperger's with a family history of scoliosis, which is important to note when assessing his posture. However, his last checkup showed no abnormal lateral curvature of the spine present. So the first examination we are going to perform is a static posture assessment, which will allow us to identify any muscle imbalances that could potentially cause an abnormal structural pattern. From an anterior view, you can see Nathan has a slightly elevated left shoulder, which is our right. This finding can be supported by the position of his hands, as his left hand lands higher on his thigh than his right. In addition, Nathan had bilateral external rotation of his feet. Although it is difficult to discern any presence of a hip hike or hip drop in these photos, his hips seemed relatively even and aligned upon palpation. Nathan's knees also appear to be aligned, as he does not present with knee valgus nor knee varus and his head also seems to be in neutral position, as depicted on the photo on the right. However, the left photo shows slight cervical deviation due to the sun obscuring his view. From a lateral view, you can see Nathan has a few abnormalities to discuss. Going from the ground up, we can see that his legs are not perpendicular to the sole of his feet, but rather pulled into slight plantar flexion. This finding could be a result of his abnormal knee hyperextension. Additionally, it appears Nathan has enhanced kyphotic curve and forward positioned head. Although it is difficult to discern any presence of an anterior or posterior pelvic tilt, his pelvis seemed level upon further inspection and palpation. From a posterior view, you can see Nathan had a slightly elevated left shoulder. From this view, you can also see that his left arm is shifted anteriorly in comparison to his right arm. However, the other kinetic checkpoints don't have any obvious abnormalities. His feet do not excessively pronate, nor do his legs appear to be knock-kneed or bow-legged. Despite the positioning of his shirt, he didn't appear to have a weight shift or hip hike either. Focusing specifically on the shoulder complex, here are some of the preliminary findings based on the static postural assessment. Nathan appears to have an elevated left shoulder, which means his upper trapezius and levitator scapulae are potentially overactive. Meanwhile, his lower trapezius is potentially underactive. Additionally, Nathan presented with rounded or hunched shoulders, which could point to having an overactive pectoral minor and potentially an underactive rhomboid. Some potential causes for these abnormal findings may be caused by repetitive actions that incite the aforementioned muscle imbalances, or it might possibly be due to a structural abnormality, just like scoliosis. So the second examination we are going to perform is a transitional movement assessment, which will allow us to observe an individual's movement patterns without changing their base of support. From an anterior view, you can see Nathan's feet are turned outward or externally rotated. In addition, Nathan's knees also appear to move outward in the photo on the left. However, during the video of the overhead squat assessment, his knees were relatively steady and did not deviate. 
Although the interior view of the overhead squat does not address the shoulder complex, these findings suggest that his lower extremity may have an overactive gastrocnemius and an underactive anterior tibialis. From a lateral view, you can see Nathan allows his arms to fall forward during his overhead squat assessment. However, his head and LPHC appear to be aligned with no presence of cervical flexion or low back displacement. Based on these findings, focusing specifically on the shoulder complex, some overactive muscles could be the pectoral major and minor, meanwhile a few underactive muscles could be the rhomboids, middle and lower trapezius, as well as some deep neck flexors. From a posterior view, you can see Nathan has a slight pronation of both feet during his overhead squat assessment. However, he does not appear to have an asymmetrical weight shift. Although the posterior view does not address the shoulder complex, these findings suggest that his lower extremity may have an overactive prononeus and an underactive anterior tibialis. Focusing specifically on the shoulder complex, here are some of the preliminary findings based on the transitional movement assessment. Nathan consistently had his arms fall forward when performing an overhead squat. This finding suggests he had weak shoulder flexion, which could potentially be caused by having an overactive teres major and an underactive anterior deltoid. Some potential causes for these abnormal findings could be lifestyle habits, especially considering he has minimal activities that take place outside of the 0 to 120 degree range of motion of shoulder flexion. His sedentary lifestyle may enable target muscles to become weak and underactive, thus causing these muscle imbalances as well. In order to get a deeper understanding of the musculature of the shoulder complex, we are going to perform a few additional examinations and assess Nathan's movement pattern. In this shoulder flexion assessment, I had Nathan raise his arms up, moving them from a neutral position into shoulder flexion. At about 130 degrees of shoulder flexion, he began to compensate by flexing his elbows to decrease the muscle tension. Based on these findings, Nathan could potentially have an overactive biceps brachii, latissimus dorsi, or pectoris major, and an underactive triceps brachii, rhomboid, and lower trapezius. When performing the rotation assessment, Nathan struggled to internally rotate both of his shoulders, which is shown by the far hand placement from the wall. In addition, Nathan also compensated by elevating his left shoulder. Based on these findings, Nathan could potentially have an overactive teres minor, infraspinatus, and upper trapezius, and an underactive rhomboid, teres major, and subscapularis. Next, we are going to review the range of motion tests that should normally be performed on an individual presenting with Nathan's shoulder assessment findings thus far. According to NASM, the normal joint end range of motion for shoulder flexion is 160 degrees. To first assess shoulder flexion, you will need to palpate for the greater tubercle and align the goniometer axis of rotation with that landmark. Next, align the stationary arm with the thorax and the mobile arm of the goniometer with the humerus. According to NASM, the normal joint end range of motion for shoulder internal rotation is 45 degrees. On your goniometer, go ahead and align the axis of rotation with the olecranon process, the stationary arm with the ulna, and the mobile arm with the fifth phalanx.
Now, we are going to be performing various manual muscle tests to assess a specific muscle strength or lack thereof. Hello, so this is Nathan. The very first mini muscle test that we're going to be performing on him today is going to be the lower trap mini muscle test. What we're going to have him do is first to go ahead and lie prone for me. So lie on your stomach. I'm going to come right on around. We're going to have him slide to the very edge of the table. Slide right on over to the left. Thank you. Next, we're going to go ahead and have him abduct his arm to about 145 degrees. Nice and straight, please. Keep that thumb pointed up at the ceiling. And then what we're going to be doing is I'm going to position my hand right below his scapula. And I'm going to push, uh, position my other hand right above his elbow. And what we're going to be doing is as I resist in a downward direction, he's going to go ahead and resist in the upward direction, okay? So ready, set, and try to read. Okay. All good. And done. So we have Nathan yet again for another mini muscle test. The next one that we're going to be performing is going to be the middle trapezius. We're going to go ahead and have him. Hello, Nathan again here. The next mini muscle test that we're going to be performing is going to be the serratus anterior. What we're going to have him do is go ahead and sit for me right at the edge of this table. And I'm going to stand right behind him. What we're going to have him do is go ahead and flex his arm for me. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and flex to about 130 degrees, making sure that thumb stays nice and straight. Next, I'm going to go ahead and position my hand right below his scapula, and then the other one right above his elbow. And what we're going to be doing is he's going to be shifting his uh, shoulder forward, trying to protract it, and I'm going to be resisting him in a downward and backwards direction. You ready? Mm -hmm. Ready, set. And you're good. So just to quickly summarize Nathan's findings thus far. In the very first static postural analysis, we saw that he had a presence of left shoulder elevation. In the second transitional assessment, we saw that Nathan consistently had his arms fall forward during his overhead squat. In the shoulder flexion assessment, we saw that Nathan compensated with elbow flexion through the movement. In the rotation assessment, we saw that Nathan had a presence of left shoulder elevation as well as a limited shoulder internal rotation. During the manual muscle test, Nathan had a score of 2 for the middle and lower trapezius, as well as the serratus anterior. This leads me to believe that potentially overactive muscles for Nathan could include the levitator scapulae, the upper trapezius, the latissimus dorsi, and the pectoralis major. Potentially underactive muscles may include the serratus anterior, the middle and lower trapezius, as well as the rhomboids. Now we will go through the corrective exercise continuum which is a systematic process used to first identify neuromusculoskeletal dysfunction, then develop a plan of action and implement an integrated corrective exercise regimen. Here are the four stages of the corrective exercise continuum, the first being inhibit, the second being lengthen, the third being activate, and the fourth being integrate. And we'll go through each step and break it down individually. The first phase, the inhibition phase, is in charge of releasing tension or decreasing the activity of overactive neuromyofascial tissues. For the first phase of the continuum, we inhibited the upper trapezius muscle using self-myofascial release via theracane. In order to target the upper trapezius specifically, I had Nathan laterally flex his neck to the right and hunt for a tender spot close to the juncture of his neck and shoulder on the posterior side. Per NASM's guidelines, I had him perform just one set of a 30 second hold. Phase 2 of the corrective exercise continuum, the lengthening phase, works on increasing the extensibility, length, and range of motion of neuromyofascial tissues. For the second phase of the corrective exercise continuum, we lengthened the pectoralis major via static stretching. In order to achieve this, I had him position his arms on either side of the doorway and take a step through the door. Per NASM's guidelines, I had Nathan perform just one set of a 30-second hold. 
Phase three of the corrective exercise continuum, the activation phase, works on re-educating or increasing the activation of underactive tissues. For the third phase of the corrective exercise continuum, we activated Nathan's lower trapezius by performing prone scaption. To get in position, I first had Nathan lie prone on the ground and instructed him to make a Y with his arms. When he was ready, I instructed him to then lift his arms up and hold for 4 seconds, ensuring he kept his elbows extended. Per NASM's guidelines, I had him repeat this movement 9 more times. The fourth and final phase of the corrective exercise continuum is the integration phase. This phase activates both the underactive and overactive muscle and retrains them to work together as a collective whole through functionally progressive movements. For the fourth and final phase of the corrective exercise continuum, I had Nathan perform resisted bilateral rotation. To get in position, I first had him bring his elbows into 90 degrees of flexion and wrapped a resistance band around both of his palms. Next, I instructed him to pull outward and hold for 4 seconds, ensuring his elbows remain tucked in close at his sides and his thumb positioned towards the ceiling. Per NASM's guidelines, I had him repeat this movement 9 more times.